So the first step in spiritualism for Seventh-day Adventism is what? To remove what? Remove the judgment. Remove the judgment. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, the Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall what? Who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? Doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Notice four principles that we can take and gather from these texts that we've just read in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Number one, preaching sound doctrine must be done in the light of what? Judgment. Did you catch that? Do we need to go back? Is everybody with me? Go back. Let's go back. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall what? Judge. The charge is to preach, but he first reminds us that there's a judgment. And because of that judgment, and he knows that the devil is going to remove the judgment, we must preach the straight testimony. We must reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering. Don't give up. Don't you dare give up on God's church, brothers and sisters. Long suffering and doctrine. And so the preaching of the word, preaching sound doctrine, which is what this is called, because it says they won't endure sound doctrine, must be done in the light of the judgment. Number two. The church will not endure this sound doctrine in the light of the judgment. They don't want that kind of preaching. They want preaching that makes them feel good after they leave. I want to feel good about myself. What's that brother that preaches in Texas? What's his name? How come you all know his name so well? Uh Uh-oh. Either you saw it walking by the book aisle in Walmart... Or you've been watching the news. Or maybe you see him on TV. God forbid that you stay long enough to listen to what he says. He's a, he's a motivational speaker. Posing as a, as a preacher. He's not a preacher. He's a businessman. His business is to make you feel good so that he can make some money. That's why he's got a mega church. Well, his sermons are not in the light of the judgment. And there will come a time where the church will not endure. They won't put up with it anymore. They don't want sound doctrine. And sound doctrine is what? Preaching in the light of the judgment. That's sound doctrine. Number three. The church instead looks to teachers of fables or falsehoods. And number four. These falsehoods are based on their own lusts. Their own lusts. Verse 3 again. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own what? Lusts. You ever stop to consider what that word lust means? After all, that's what they're basing everything on, right? If you preach sound doctrine in the light of the judgment, doesn't the judgment kind of condemn lusts? By the way, when you're preaching the judgment, listen, let's think about this. When you're preaching the judgment, what are you really upholding? The law of God. That's what you're doing. You're upholding the great standard of righteousness. Otherwise, there's no judgment, right? And so, if you preach in the light of the judgment, you cannot lust. Paul said, I had not known lust, but the law said what? Thou shalt not covet. Right? And so, this type of itching ears is created because of lust. What does it mean to lust? Lust means, and this is in the Greek, the desire 
for what is forbidden. Hmm. The desire, preach to me, give me a license to do and go against a thus saith the Lord. Give me a license to disregard thou shalt not. Does that sound familiar? Remember that old serpent who created an appetite for what was forbidden? What was Eve told? Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. Satan created an appetite. The church that's described here is forming everything based on their lusts. And when you preach sound doctrine in the light of the judgment, you cannot do that. Because you're always told it's forbidden. Amen? Don't we need a, more sermons like that coming from the pulpit? We need more sermons. Calling sin by its right name. Drawing the line clearly in the sand. And warning the Seventh-day Adventist not to cross it. Not to cross it. But we're told that based on their own lusts, they will heap to themselves Joel Osteen. Right? They'll even heap to themselves Adventist teachers. Because they've been Adventist preachers, brothers and sisters. Have you been to seminary? How many of you have been to the Andrews Theological Seminary and have an MDiv? Am I the only one? You do? You have been to Andrews? You've been to Andrews? Have you, you have an MDiv? Oh, not as a student. As a student. I'm the only one? Then you'll have to take my word for it. At least half of the books that I read were not of our faith. Not of our faith. And you know, at the time, I didn't care because I was burnt out in ministry. I had been in the, in the ministry for about four years. I was just going to go to seminary and get C's. I didn't want to get on the you know, honors when I, was at, like I, when I was at Southwestern. And so I went to Andrews and studied for my MDiv as part of ordination track. What are we reading, brothers and sisters? No wonder we think differently. Amen? What are we teaching in our schools? You better pray earnestly. Pray earnestly for our people. Pray. It's creating an appetite for what is forbidden. And then we teach it from the pulpit. How will the devil get us, get us to bite? How will he get you to bite? How will he get you to cross that line? It won't be with sound doctrine in the light of the judgment. It has to be something else. Remember, sound doctrine in the light of the judgment. That defines sound doctrine. There's something else, brothers and sisters, and it's only a book away. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, when? In the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. There's that creating that desire. And doctrines of devils. So you have sound doctrine being preached in the light of the judgment, and you have doctrines of devils that seduce you. I wonder what they're seducing you to do. You think the devils are going to preach in the light of the judgment in the last days? No. No. They're, he's removing the judgment, he removes the judgment. And I don't even have to preach on that. It's being done. You know it. You know it. There's an attack on the judgment. Doctrines of devils, brothers and sisters, according to Great Controversy 444, equals spiritualism. This, this doctrines of devils is the same thing as saying spiritualism. So in the last days, some will depart from the faith and they will give heed to the spiritualism that seduces them. So you either endure sound doctrine in the light of the judgment or you heap unto yourselves after your own lusts what you want to hear. And that, my friends, is spiritualism. That's spiritualism. We've got to call it by its right name. Spiritualism first removes the judgment. Now I want to take you to a passage that is very well known to you. It's in the book of James. But I want you to see what I saw, once again, as I was putting this together. Because James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, takes us through this, this tension, 
this struggle between the law and the judgment. And then he moves to another area that's going to take us to step two and three. Now watch this. The doctrine of devils. Are you ready to see it? The Bible will show us. James chapter 2 and verse 10. And it will spell it out, brothers and sisters. Not yet, though. James 2 and verse 10. Watch the tension between the judgment and the law. He's dealing with it, just like we are today. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, commandment keeping, and yet offend in how many points? One point. He is what? Judgment. Is that judgment? When a person judges, when the judge judges, he does what? Guilty. If you offend in one point, the Bible says, you are guilty of all. Why is he teaching this? Could it be that there were some that thought they could you know, cheat a little here and bend a little here and adjust a little bit here? God didn't mean what he says and doesn't, doesn't say what he means. And he's not going to do what he says. James is breaking it down. He says, no, no, no. If you offend in just one point, you'll be guilty of all. For he that has said, do not commit adultery. Now we know he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Said also, do not kill. Now if you commit no adultery, but if you kill, thou art become what? Is that judgment? You are pronounced a, com- a transgressor of the law. There it is again. The issue. Verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be what? Judged by the law, guess what? It's supposed to set you free. Amen? The law? You like fences? You like to be fenced in? There's a pit bull on the other side. Would you like a fence between you and him? I would too. The law of God sets us free. What does the Bible say? The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting. The soul. That means repenting the soul. It turns the soul. It sets the soul free from the bondage of sin. Why? Because it turns us and causes us to face first ourselves. We see ourselves for who we really are. And then we see the Savior. And then we reach out for His power to save. Verse 13, for he shall have judgment. There's the word again. Without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Right from the the Sermon on the Mount. And mercy rejoiceth against what? Judgment. So is it fair to say that so far in the book of James chapter 2, verses 10 through 13, he's addressing judgment. Is that right? And he's addressing commandment keeping. Is that fair to say? Because there's a tension between the two. You see, it goes all the way back, like we said. The devil knew that if he could remove the judgment, Eve would cross the line. She would have nothing that would prohibit her from doing so. And James is dealing with his church in his time that the devil is also working against them. And so first we set, let him set the precedence here. Set the stage. Now let's keep reading and watch what happens. Watch. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not what? Uh Uh-oh. What is he dealing with now? Faith without works. Because works without the judgment means nothing, brothers and sisters. If you remove the judgment, you've removed works because we're judged by our what? Works. So if you remove the judgment, no investigative judgment, it's all done at the cross, then you are no longer accountable and you can limit your faith to a faith without works. Do you see this, brothers and sisters? What doth it profit? James is dealing with these issues right in his church. The attack of spiritualism. What does it profit? Can faith save him? Can faith save him? And then he, he, he does this uh, practical illustration of a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food. And so you give them food, but you don't give them any clothing. Does it profit? It's not one or the other. 
Even so, faith, if it hath not what? Works is dead, being alone. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me my, thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. What does the investigative judgment reveal to the professor of Christianity? The so-called professor. The one who claims to believe. The investigative judgment shows your faith by your works. Just like this says. That's why we're judged by works. Because it demonstrates your faith. Verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also, what? Believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Did you catch it? Where's the doctrines of devils? The devils also believe. But what is their belief? Faith without works. You remove the judgment, you remove works. You remove true faith. Now all you have is a dead faith. You ever seen any dead faith in your church? Where there's no outward works. We don't even look like Seventh-day Adventists anymore. We don't talk like it. We don't eat like it. We don't dress like it. We don't go places and stay away from places like we should. It's a dead faith. Because there's no works. And really, subtly, whether we realize it or not, the judgment is kept out of sight. The doctrines of devils is faith without works. We're still not to the four-letter word, though. So let's, let's just take a simple mathematical equation. If A equals B... Faith minus works equals doctrines of devils. Okay? And B equals C. Doctrines of devils equals spiritualism. Then A equals C. Faith without works is spiritualism. Don't argue with people that say we can't keep the commandments. We don't have to. We don't have to be perfect. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to show you four things you have to do for that person. Well, I'm going to show you three things they have to do but you're included in it, and the fourth one is how we battle against spiritualism. Don't just argue with them. Just realize you're up against doctrines of devils. You think they're just going to listen to you? There's more involved. You see, we don't care about each other in the church today. We, do, we don't, we just let, we're not our brother's keeper. We just let people go. Oh, we talk about them behind their back. We might argue with them, fuss and fight, you know, get frustrated, point out sin. How do you deal with it? First, you've got to know what it is. What is this doctrine that you can believe, but your life doesn't have to testify to your faith? It's spiritualism. Good old-fashioned spiritualism. And it's here, brothers and sisters. It's been here for a long time. And we need to realize, the question is, how did it get here? How did it get here? You and I led it, that's how. We let it get here. We allowed it to come in the door. We shook its hand and we said, Happy Sabbath, brother. Happy Sabbath, sister. You want to be baptized? I'll baptize you right now. You don't have to quit smoking. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to change the way you eat. Aren't we doing that today? I'm just going to baptize you. Hey, they can change later. That's spiritualism, brothers and sisters. We have evangelists of spiritualism. You ever had an evangelist come to your church? I've worked with evangelists. They tried to dunk them. I said, uh-uh. No, 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 not yet. They wanted to get the numbers before they left my church. I said, no. I've worked with people six months after evangelists and me, trying to ground them in the investigative judgment, the foundational pillar of our church. And we're going to let that go? You're just going to let that go? And just sit there every Sabbath and say, well, nothing we can do. You know what I've heard recently? The Lord is in control of His church. He'll take care of it. I don't have to do anything. You know where that person's going? Straight to hell. I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, if you treat your fellow brothers and sisters like that, you're lost. You will be. 
That is not the character of Christ. Christ didn't walk around saying, my father will take care of everything. I don't have to deal with these Pharisees here. I don't have to say a word. You read the Gospels again, brothers and sisters. Don't read it the way people are making Jesus out to be a, a, you know, a hippie again or something. He's, he's so soft and so ecumenical and so concerned about the planet and he wants to save the animals and all this. You know, read it for what it really is. We have let this come in to the church. And part of the reason why we let it come in is because we've been tricked into thinking that it's just going to happen. And part of it is we don't know what it is that's coming in. We don't know. We just don't know. But I'm here to tell you today, faith without works is not just a false doctrine. It's not just, it's spiritualism. It is spiritualism. You see how it's not enough to believe in ghosts? You know? The devil is not going to try and bring a ghost to your bed and try to convince you that, you know, the spirits are... He's not going to convince you to go to a psychic, are you? I hope none of you have gone there, you know, checked for the pastor, elders coming, call up on the phone. Are you going to do that? But you're going to fellowship people who don't demonstrate their faith by their works, aren't you? We do it all the time, brothers and sisters. Church discipline is a thing of the past. If you want to see how much spiritualism is controlling your church, you take the most offensive member. And I'm not talking about people who are secretly sinning. I'm talking about a member that is openly, willfully defiant against God and against church authority and against church doctrine. You try to take a person like that. Praise the Lord if you don't have one like that. You try, you know, we got adulterers in the church, Sabbath breakers, smokers, all the, go to the church manual, look at the list of reasons why a church member should be disciplined. Go to that person. Visit with them. Try to win them back to God. Point out their sin and call them to repentance. See how your church reacts to that. See how the pastor reacts. See how the elders react. You will know if you attempt to practice church discipline, you will know whether or not your church is taken over by spiritualism. You will know. You know why? Because what are you bringing back as the foundation? Accountability. Judgment. And if you don't believe we're supposed to judge, read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul said, we have it backwards. We have it backwards. We talk all bad about the world, but we won't judge each other in the church. 1 Corinthians 5 says, we are not to judge the world. We're to judge each other. That's the truth. And we're to judge with righteous judgment. Then you'll tell how much spiritualism is in your church. Because I've seen its ugly head rear up and it had teeth. And it said, no way. We're not going to deal with this. Because my children are living this way too. And if we deal with this, your pastor is going to come after my children. You know? Everybody's got the sin that they're trying to tolerate. And if we push one pin down, all the pins fall down. So they say, no, let it be. Let it, let it cohabitate together. Spiritualism in the church. Listen. Desire of Ages 126. Faith is in no sense allied. There's that word allied. See it? Did you see that word in our first presentation? Union. Ally. Faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption. For presumption is Satan's what? counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. Presumption is counterfeit faith. You, do you know God's promises are conditional? God's promises are for the righteous. Sounds pretty strange, huh? You know the Bible is for the man of God, not for the sinner? The Bible is not for the carnal man. The carnal man is enmity against God's law and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Amen? The Bible is written for the, the, the believer. And the only per- way a person embraces the Bible is to become a believer. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. All Scripture. And so the promises, read them sometime. Promises are not unconditional. The angel of the, I just I did a children's story on this, Psalm 4, 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about those that fear him and delivereth them. There's a condition. Roman, this is a famous one of people. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. And then they stop there. They say, the Lord's going to work it out. Don't worry. All things work together for good. But there's two conditions. To those that love God, and if you love me, keep my what? So, to those that keep God's commandments and that are what? Called according to His purpose. And what does verse 29 say? That we are to be restored back into His image. That's His purpose. So, all things work together for good, brothers and sisters, if you're keeping God's commandments. And you're being changed into his likeness. But all things don't work together for good to those that break God's commandments. Amen? God's promises cannot be claimed to excuse transgression. Otherwise, that's presumption. And presumption is a counterfeit faith. And faith without works is spiritualism. Spiritualism. The question is, how does it work? How does this whole thing work? You ready? All right, let's go. How does all this work? Galatians 5, 6. Faith works by what? By love. By love. love. That's how faith works, right? That's what it says. Faith works by love. Desire of Ages 126. Faith would would have led our first parents to trust what? The love of God and to do what? Obey His commandments. Watch this. Presumption led them to transgress His law, believing that His great what? Love would save them from what? The consequences of their sin. you got all four components right there. You remove the judgment, the consequences of sin. You transgress the law of God. And then all you have is presumption. Believing that His great what? Love is the four-letter word, brothers and sisters. Spiritualism is love. Counterfeit love. That's why you keep the door open. Because you want to be like Jesus, right? You want to love Him. Yeah. Presumption works. By love, too. Not just faith. Presumption works by love. Patriarchs and Prophets 5.22 Satan deceives many with the plausible theory that God's love for His people is so great that He will excuse sin in them. He represents that while the threatenings of God's Word are to serve a certain purpose in His moral government, they are never to be literally fulfilled. I know Seventh-day Adventists who say the lake of fire is symbolism. It's symbolic. Why? Because His great love would not allow it, brothers and sisters. But in all His dealings with His creatures, God has maintained the principles of righteousness. Amen? By revealing sin in its true character, by demonstrating that its sure result is misery, And death, the unconditional pardon of sin, never has been and never will be. Such pardon would show the abandonment of the principles of righteousness, which are the very foundation of the government of God. It would fill the unfallen universe with what? Consternation. What does that mean? Amazement. They would be like, it would, see, we got to think about the universe too, don't we? Not just our ourselves. If God were to abandon the principles of His righteousness, it would fill the unfallen universe with consternation. God has faithfully pointed out the results of sin. And if these warnings were not true, how could we be sure that His promises would be fulfilled? 
that so-called benevolence. And what is a bene- another word from benevolence? Love. Which would set aside justice is not benevolence, but weakness. How does it work, brothers and sisters? Faith plus love equals obedience with accountability. This is the three angels' messages. Faith plus love equals obedience with judgment. Amen? Presumption plus counterfeit love equals disobedience without accountability. This is spiritualism. And Laodicea is infected with it. If you don't believe me, let's go through it. What does Laodicea lack that she doesn't know? Well, Jesus offers to supply it. He says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You check the spirit of prophecy for what that means. The Bible already says it's faith. But Ellen White says clearly it's faith and love. Laodicea doesn't have faith. It has presumption and it doesn't have love. It has a counterfeit love. Does Laodicea have white raiment? No, Jesus says, buy of me. What is white raiment? It's the righteousness of Christ revealed in perfect conformity to the law of God, obedience in the Christian life. Does Laodicea have accountability? No, because the sixth church was the Philadelphian church, right? And what door was open that no man could shut? And what door was shut that no man could open? The door to the most holy place, we're told. This is the time of William Miller, the Second Great Awakening. This church represents the time, a period where Jesus, in 1844, moved into the most holy place, the investigative judgment. And we're told in early writings, page 56, that the devil would, is trying to draw back God's people into what apartment? The holy place. So if he removes the judgment, then we have no white raiment, no gold tried in the fire. Laodicea, her condition is under the spell of spiritualism. And spiritualism is a four-letter word. And that word is what? It's love. It's love. You know, Charles Spurgeon said that discernment, which Laodicea doesn't have either, is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Almost right. That's what we need. That's the ISAV. That's the ISAV. Well, let's see this in the spirit of prophecy. Great Controversy 558. It is true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features. It's assuming a what? Christian guise. Or I could say a Christ-like guise. It is really a more dangerous because a more subtle deception. While it formally denounced Christ and the Bible, it now professes to accept both. But... The Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. What is the unrenewed heart? Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. The Bible is interpreted in a manner so that we can fulfill the lusts. We can have that which is forbidden. We can believe in a God and still remain carnal. This is the work of spiritualism. That's why we're coming up with all these weird interpretations in the Bible. Some of the sisters were sharing some at our table for lunch. Why are we coming up with all these weird interpretations? Because we're interpreting the Bible in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. The, the Holy Spirit being the seal. What, was this do- what is this doctrine doing? It's removing the Sabbath truth. You remove the law of God, right? You remove the law of God and the seal. All of a sudden, the mark of the beast is not the Sunday Sabbath issue, right? Right? That's what it's getting at. You can detect it. You can see it. This is spiritualism. You can't just argue with it. There's more to it, brothers and sisters. While its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect. And so it interprets the Bible this way, and then it makes of no effect the solemn and vital truths. 
love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God. What is dwelt upon by spiritualism? Love. As what? The chief attribute. But it is degraded into a weak sentimentalism. You want to hear a sentimental statement about the love of God? I'll tell you. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be hanging on it. If God had a wallet, your picture would be in it. Isn't that a touching thought of God's love? That's sentimentalism, brother and sister. That's weak. But yet we're like, oh, I feel so good. Does it convict you of sin? Is there any standard? No, it's just a, it's just a, a human-like quality that we degrade it into. But what does it do? What does this weak sentimentalism do? Watch. It makes little distinction between good and evil. God's justice, watch this now, His justice, His denunciations of sin, that means His reproof of sin, the requirements of His holy law are all what? Kept out of sight. Am I making this up? This is the chapter on spiritualism in the great controversy. Love sets aside His judgment, sets, keeps out of sight the requirements of His holy law, and keeps it there so you can't get it back. Because you have to challenge that four-letter word. And brothers and sisters, this is the hardest battle the church has ever had to fight. Because you are dealing with the love, so-called love of God. Get ready to be misunderstood. Get ready to be called a bigot, a hateful person, a critical, mean-spirited. Get ready. Satan has it all worked out now. You're going to have to go forward and not care what anybody thinks about you and do what is right because it is right and trust in the true love of God. They're all kept out of sight. Christ is as verily denied as before. In other words, that's not Christ's character. But Satan has so blinded the eyes of the people that the deception is not discerned. Remember that brother that I was telling you about who was breaking the Sabbath? At the church business meeting when we, brought up, when we pointed out his sin, I had members standing up and throwing me throwing at me all kinds of statements about Jesus. He that is, that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Judge not that you be not judged. They were using Christ's character, Christ's teachings to remove the standards, to remove accountability. And I recognized right away, this is not the true love of God. This is the counterfeit spiritualism. Spiritualism. So what does it do? What does this false love do? It assumes a Christian guise. It's in the church now. It's a more dangerous because it's a more subtle deception. It professes to accept both God and the Bible. So it'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, with the Scriptures. But it interprets the Bible that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart. Leave out sanctification. Don't talk about holiness. Don't talk about commandment-keeping. It wants to live in sin and not be subject to the law of God. Subject means accountable to the law of God. It dwells upon love as the chief attribute of God. It degrades God's love into weak sentimentalism. It teaches that God's love makes little distinction between good and evil. It's unconditional, brothers and sisters. You ever heard that word? God's love is not unconditional. It's not. We might want it because it pleases the flesh. And we can live in peace and harmony and unity and pretend like there's nothing wrong with the church. God's love does make distinction between good and evil. Aren't you glad for that? I don't want to live with the devil in heaven on the new earth. I, mean, I, I, don't want, to, I want things to be fixed, don't you? And I want myself to be fixed. I want all this problem in here to get worked out. You know? This weak sentimentalism keeps God's justice out of sight. It removes it. It keeps God's reproof of sin out of sight. And it keeps the requirements of God's law out of sight. You ever seen this, heard of this movie? There's a new movie coming out. You'll see the, the cover of the movie on the next slide. It's called Seventh Gay Adventists. You ever seen that? 
You never seen that? It's coming. It's coming, brothers and sisters. It's coming. You know, the union, that, the conference that I belong to, that I got fired from, the union that they belong to has a reputation for being conservative. You know, they just voted as a union to ordain women clergy. First you get ordination of women clergy, then you start ordaining gay clergy. History teaches us. It's the pattern of the enemy. And we're going to let it come in. So this movie, let's read about it here real quick because I want you to see and hear the tone of this. This is an extreme example, but it's coming. It's coming. Speaking of miracles, look what they're talking about. Speaking of miracles and doors opening, the way in which the film has been received so far feels like a huge answer to prayer. Who's answering that prayer? Well, to them it's God because he makes no distinction between what? Good and evil. See, that's the way I was born, right? Can't change it. The response has been beyond what we have hoped and prayed for. We've been praying about this film. These are Seventh-day Adventists. By the way, the, there's a couple that made this film, and they're heterosexual. They're not, they're not homosexual. They just really believe that we need to reach out to these people and love them and fellowship them. After a private screening here in San Francisco for a group of about 60 Adventist theologians and religious teachers, 60, the feedback that we kept hearing was, the tone of this film and the story approach is the best way to move this conversation forward in a positive way in the church, regardless of theological differences. Don't bring up sound doctrine and theology. Let's just have a touching story presented to us. Here's the cover. Seventh Day Adventist shows two Seventh Day Adventists walking down the beach. The, little t- the top there says some people pay a very high price to keep their faith. In other words, we're a very unloving church, and it's very hard to be in the church. They go on to say, one of the film's strongest messages of what? Hope is that people with differing theologies can live in community, what? Together. People with different theologies can love each other with the love that Jesus said would distinguish His followers from others. That is not true, brothers and sisters. That's not the love that Jesus said the whole world would see and call us His disciples. This is a counterfeit love. It's spiritualism. It's spiritualism. And it comes in a four-letter word. L-O-V-E. These people believe this. And you'd be surprised how many church members will go along with this. For the sake of love. Our longtime friend of ours who saw the film in Loma Linda had a great way of describing the film's tone. He quoted Hosea 11.4 when God is describing how God has led Israel. In other words, God is leading His church to this point, brothers and sisters. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of what? Love. That's another spirit leading. That's not the love of God. God's word is plain about homosexuality, isn't it? Will it enter the kingdom of heaven? No, it won't. Will stealing enter the kingdom of heaven? No. Lying? It's all sin, brothers and sisters. And it all can be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It can. And even if it can't be changed, we can deny ourselves how often? Daily. Take up the cross and follow Jesus. The tone, remember this. You see, the tone is shifting in Adventism. I'm going to share one last thing with you here that is going to share another tone in Adventism. You see, we're calling darkness light and light darkness, but we're seeing it through the lens of love and we're getting it backwards. It's spiritualism that is leading us to do this. Every time that we remove the judgment and we change our faith, it's fueled by love. Listen, great controversy. We're going to shift gears. I'm just giving you an extreme situation here. We're going to shift gears now, and we're going to go back to prophecy. And I want to end with prophecy, because I want you to see something that's happening in our church right now. Please, I invite you. You know, I've had reactions already to what I'm about to share with you, and they're reactions from conservative members. 
very conservative. And they got very angry when I shared this. And they tried to disrupt the meeting. And I'm telling you, the devil is going to deceive, if possible, the very elect. He's already got the liberals. If you want to use these terms, they're old terms. He already got the liberals. He's moving in on the conservatives. And you know what he's doing? He's bringing the Sadducees and the Pharisees together. And he's uniting them on love. He's doing it. And I'll show you how in a few minutes. Let's shift to prophecy. Watch how love worked to take down Protestantism. Great Controversy 571. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity, false love has what? Blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil. And as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. In other words, they don't want to believe evil of anybody. They're going to tolerate everybody. But the inevitable result is they're going to believe evil of all good. So in other words, they're going to turn around and persecute the good people. But first, they're going to receive all the bad people because that's false charity. It blinds the eyes. Instead of standing in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints, they are now, as it were, apologizing to who? Protestants are apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable opinion of her. Begging pardon for their what? Bigotry. Was the Protestant Reformation bigotry? Was it love? Absolutely. But today, because of false love, because of spiritualism, we're changing the way we see things, and now all of a sudden we're the bad guy. The way we treat, treated Roman Catholicism was not the way Jesus would have had us to act. Serious, serious, brothers and sisters. All because of four letters. L-O-V-E. Love. Spiritualism is taking control. And it's going to warp everything. Let's, let's take a look at this. You know who this brother is? Elder Ted Wilson. He became conference president. When he became president um, at a pastor's retreat, I think it was just myself and one other pastor uh, that were kind of excited. The other pastors, including the president, ministerial secretary, all of them, they said, we got to pray. This is not good for our church. You know, you know how, you know that the whole, you know, we're retrograde Adventism, we're going back to the Stone Age and all this. But God inserted Elder Wilson for such a time as this. And one of the things that he did, or that he tried to do, was follow up on Jack Henderson's lay movement. You, you familiar with Jack Henderson from North Carolina? He is the one who started the great controversy mail out the mass mail out of the Great Controversy. And he offered it at a very reasonable price to churches, whoever wanted to, to get it. And my church uh, bought about 30,000 and we mailed them out to our whole town. And uh, as a result, we have a couple that were baptized. And so Elder Wilson, when he came into office, he came up with the idea that we were going to have what was called the Great Controversy Project. Amen? Amen. So... The leaders got together and they formed this group and they began to pray and the world leaders got together and uh, they launched this idea, Great Controversy Project. Good idea? Not to everybody. There was a very negative reaction to Elder Wilson's vision, which I happen to be as God's vision. I happen to believe that when Elder Wilson spoke that, I think he was speaking directly from the heart of God. That God wants this message to go out. He's been wanting it to go out for so long. But there was an opposition that, that was stirred from it. And I want to read to you, as we move forward in this, I want to read to you excerpts from an article called Will the Great, Con Will the Great Controversy Project Harm Adventism? Will the Great Controversy Project harm Adventism? This is, of course, from Spectrum magazine. Many of you know, have heard of Spectrum. I don't encourage you to read it unless you're, you know, looking for a, that perspective. But it's written August 26, 2011, not too long ago, by a pastor, a pastor, Eddie Johnson. These are some of his comments in his article. I'm not going to read the whole article, but he starts out by saying this. We've gotten in trouble because of 
the great controversies, anti-Catholic tone. Why, what kind of tone? Why repeat the what? Offense. Now, what was the tone of the Seventh-day Adventists? A loving tone. But all of a sudden, when we tell the truth, we're anti-Catholic, and it's an offensive tone. What's going on, brothers and sisters? Shouldn't we be condemning the, the seventh gay Adventists and upholding the great controversy? The tone is changing. Do you see that? Spiritualism has come in. And it's come in the form of love. But it's a false love. He also says, I believe. Watch this kind of faith now. I believe that the book was inspired. And I know that Ellen White wrote that it should be placed in all the homes. But... Don't ever say but when you say I believe. Because your but just cancel your belief. Amen? You can believe all you want. And you can know all you want. The devils believe and know and tremble, don't they? But faith without works is dead. That's spiritualism. He said, but I find myself wondering. Hmm, don't do that, brother. If doing so, that means giving the great conference, at this time in history is why. Wait a second. Would there be a better time in earth's history to do this? He's wondering whether this is the right thing to do. He says, did not the Apostle Paul write that we should not treat the prophecies with contempt? I'm going to go on. You, you, I can, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go on. I've got to get to some other stuff. Anyway, he tries to use the Bible to say that we need to test the relevance of the great controversy, whether it's relevant today or not totally out of context. He says, I do not believe that having to face irate people and the press and maybe the court charged with distributing hate literature is necessarily what Christ had in mind when he said that those who should be persecuted for his namesake should consider themselves as blessed. So in other words, he's saying, you know, I don't believe that we should really distribute this if it's going to produce this type of reaction. That's not what Jesus had in mind. Well, let me ask you this. Um, did the disciples preach hateful messages? No. But didn't they say, you murderers? Didn't they call the church at that time? Didn't they call them by its right name? And they died for it, brothers and sisters. Stephen was stoned for calling the Jews murderers. And they even said, how dare you bring his blood upon us? What are we bringing upon the Catholic Church in the Great Conference? The responsibility the blood of the martyrs and the saints. The Bible does it, doesn't it? I'm just saying what the Bible says in the spirit of prophecy. But he says, I don't believe that would be a good thing to do based on the response. Listen, imagine if the reformers didn't do that. Imagine. Oh, our brothers and sisters of old suffered, friends. They suffered. How dare we cowardly use these types of excuses? Beyond my personal experiences, I have listed below some reasons why I am not sure of the wisdom in mass distribution of the great controversy. He's challenging the wisdom now in this. Have we already been told to do it? But now he's got some other type of wisdom. He gives three reasons. Number one, it's too long. <laughs> the length of the book. Now I'm bringing this out for a reason. I'm going to show you something. He says, I believe that it is much to expect that people would take the time to open a 600 page plus page book, which moreover requires at least a passing interest in European history. Talk about the 1260 years. He says, people are not interested anymore. They don't want to read these long books. Okay? This is, this is, a, this is what he's saying, okay? So, so I, I'm, I'm reading this to you because I want you to see something that happened to the Great Controversy Project. Number two, he says postmodernism. Postmodernism rejects any idea that pretends to gather together clusters of events that have no natural link with one another and interpret them in terms of a common theme and ascribe meaning to them. Isn't that what the great controversy does? It takes events and it links them together. It's called a meta narrative, an overarching explanation of a state of affairs. He said postmodern mind finds it problematic to accept that. So we can't give the great controversy because they don't accept that. By the way, let me read this real quick. Page 608. This is what the early Christian church did. Okay? 
This is what it did. It says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. This is what this brother is doing. I did it, brothers and sisters. Whenever you hear someone say, we need to study the postmodern mind, or the secular mind, or the unchristian mind, you know what they're saying? They're really saying, I think that way. You see, they're saying study like them because they no longer want to do what God says. They want to change the method so that they can feel comfortable doing evangelism the way they think, not the way that other people think. This church growth movement is a total flip. And it says we got to change because of them. No, we've partaken of the same spirit. We think like them. And we're trying to reach them by lowering the standards in our own lives. I know this is a lot of stuff. But the Lord said to bring it, so I had to bring it. I, I resisted putting all this material together. You don't realize how much of a struggle it was for me. But I had to do it. He said, you have to deliver the word, so I did. Look at what it says. The author of the great controversy does just that. When she gathers historical events covering almost 200 years and incorporates them into a vast panoramic concept, that she identifies it as the war between God and Satan. As believers, this approach is highly as acceptable as this seems to us as believers. This approach is highly suspicious to most contemporary readers. Okay, now that, that may be true, but the question is, do we not give the book? Do we not give the book? These people are giving reasons why we should not listen to Elder Ted Wilson and mass distribute the great controversy. This is the tension. Let's do it by faith. Let's not do it because of these reasons, one, two, three, and all this. Okay, this is the most disturbing reason. Does it contain error? Adventist scholars spend quite a bit of time researching our beliefs and practices. Most of the time, the research will confirm the doctrines under scrutiny, but sometimes the scholars are led to acknowledge that added insights shed new light that calls for a re-evaluation of some beliefs. Over time, the new understanding becomes part of our system of beliefs. Thus, many scholars and well-informed church members, that means worldly church members, consider somewhat outmoded some prophetic interpretations and beliefs that are presented in the book. In other words, there's error in the great controversy. These cases in point are, number one, the signs in the sun, moon, and stars dating back some 200 years are not considered to be indicative of the nearness of the parousia, the coming. That's a Greek word for the second coming. Uh, even though Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 talk about that as happening right in the end of time, they say, well, you know, what she wrote about in the great controversy, it's, it really, we shouldn't have that in there. Number two, you ready? The understanding of the investigative judgment. Didn't even say anything else. He just said, the understanding of the investigative judgment is not true. There's error. Remember what we learned? Spiritualism through false love removes the investigative judgment. You're going to see something that's going to happen to this book. You're going to see something. You need to be aware of it, brothers and sisters. Spiritualism is in your face right now. And it is doing whatever it wants. Does it contain error? Number three. That it is Satan and not God that pours the seven bowls over the wicked. Oh, remove the judgment. So now we can blame Satan for the destruction of the wicked. But my Bible says it's God and the holy angels. Spiritualism through false love removes the executive judgment. Now why do I share all this with you? Well, let me share this next statement. The people who might choose to read the book, Great Controversy, will probably be the kind of readers that will question some of the theological material and find it wanting, reject the book altogether. Baloney. You know what? We're the ones rejecting it, not them. We're using them as a scapegoat, and we don't want to admit we don't believe in the book. Why don't we just come out and say, Elder Wilson, we don't believe in the Great Controversy, instead of trying to fake it and say, well it's not going to be successful and it's going to be rejected and all this stuff. No, no, no. We 
don't want it to go out. Meaning those that are against the book. And so, what has happened? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we go to this next slide and as we look into this a little bit more, we want your spirit to be with us, Lord. We don't, I don't know what the reactions will be, but help my words to be such that they will be clear and uh, may your spirit teach us. We're about to look at what you've identified as spiritualism, taking over the very heart of this church with the most important book that ever came from the pen of inspiration. In Jesus' name, help us, Lord. Amen. Elder Wilson said, let's mail it out. God said, do it, let's do it. Let's do it now. You know, he's sensing the nearness of that. Let's finish the work. Revival and reformation. Others are saying, no, 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 no. Don't do it. It's going to harm Adventism. They give all the reasons. And so what happens? You have a compromise. You have a compromise in the general conference. And they've taken out the name, great controversy, and they've called it the great hope. The great hope is, there. it comes in many versions. It, it, there's different abridged versions. But there is one version that has a different title, but it's the same book. Praise the Lord. But, because of all these liberal accusations and arguments, they decided to change the great controversy. Change it. Change the content. Change the content. We have, and by the way, brothers and sisters, North American Division website, which we're going to look at right here, has a great hope project. Every division is supposed to come up with a plan. They plan to mail out 2,000 of these Great Hope original versions. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 million. And 1 million of the version I'm going to show you. 1 million. I'm going to go through. I'm going to, all, in all fairness to, to the book, I'm going to go through rapidly and show you the original titles of the Great Controversy. And I'm going to show you what's in the book, the abridged version, and not in the book. Do you know how big the abridged version is? 92 pages. 11 chapters. In, 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 the, in the adapted version, which is the smallest book, it only has 11 chapters. It has 31 chapters removed. Okay? Now, why are we doing this, brothers and sisters? Because the great controversy has an anti-Catholic tone to it. It's not loving. False charity. Is it blinding our eyes? Are we apologizing to Rome? Brothers and sisters, let's finish the work. But the, the devil is coming in and he's trying to create a compromise. And what are we doing about it? Watch this. The adapted version we're not using in North American Division. But they're using it around the world. That's the 11 chapters, um, 92 pages. The abridged version is also 92 pages and 11 chapters. But what they do is, they'll take like five chapters from the original Great Controversy and they'll put it into one chapter and they'll take, they'll compile it, they'll take excerpts and they switch it all around because they don't want that meta-narrative, right? Because the postmodern mind won't receive it. So they switch it all around. You got things all over the place, okay? But what I'm going to show you is a list of the chapters in the original Great Controversy, and you're going to see which ones are in the abridged version and which ones got left out. And when you see which ones got left out, you're going to know why. It is not because it's going to be successful in leading people. By the way, the argument is it's an entering wedge to the Great Controversy. We don't want to give them the whole book yet. We want to give them this abridged version, which is all confused up, because then they'll want the original book. You buy that? No. No. The early Christian church, they thought, well, let's modify some of our beliefs and it'll be a means to their full what? Conversion. Did it work? No. no. Is the same spirit working today? It's called spiritualism. It led to the formation of the papacy. Yes. It will lead to the destruction of the Seventh-day Adventist church in the sense 
that it will cause most, if possible, we're told, even the very elect, to join the ranks of spiritualism. And it is just saying, I dare you. Look what I can do. Brothers and sisters, the dragon, spiritualism, is wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant, which keep the commandments of God. And what? Have, we don't have 32 chapters anymore, brothers. 31 chapters is gone in the adapted version. Do we have the testimony of Jesus? I don't care what anybody says, the reasons why we did this. The devil is tampering with the great controversy. Watch this. In the abridged version that's going out, 11 chapters, they have excerpts from chapter 1 in chapter 9 in the abridged version called The Real Hope. Chapters 2 through 6 are not in the book. Chapter 7, they have it in, in a chapter called True Peace. The, the, the titles and the numbers and parentheses are the abridged version. Remember, there's 11 chapters. So when I give you 9 Real Hope, that's in the ninth chapter. They've taken it from the first chapter, put it in the ninth chapter, and they've taken excerpts out. Chapters 8, 9, 10, 11. Remember what the, what the brother said in Spectrum? I'm ashamed to call him a brother. Remember he said that, that it's too long of a book? Remember he said that who's going to want to read that European history? Do not, you know what I've been told by conservatives? They said, you should not judge motives. Conservatives are telling me that this will be an effective tool. This is Christ-like. We're reaching the people where they're at. Don't believe it. Because you know why we're really doing it? Because we're compromising with liberals in our, in our church. This is a product of compromise. This is the spirit of compromise. This isn't Christ-like to do this. And Christ does not partner with the enemy. We need to call it what it is. This is a product of spiritualism under the guise of love and evangelism. And brothers, I'll just go on. Okay, that's chapters 1 through 11. Chapters 12 through 22. No French Revolution, no Netherlands, no English reformers, nothing. It's all out. Why? Because they said they got their way. They argued for it. Chapter 17. Heralds of the Morning. That's in chapter 9, Real Hope. That's excerpts are put in there. Brothers and sisters, where's Adventism? It's gone. Because an American reformer is William Miller. Oh, we can't give that. We, can't. we need an entering wedge. By the way, what's our entering wedge? The health message. Not an adapted version of the great controversy. But those that want this version don't practice the health message. So they don't believe in that. Look at that. Chapter 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 are gone. They're missing. They're not in the abridged version. That's, that's Adventism. That's a formation of Adventism. Where's the sanctuary? Chapter 23 is gone. Chapter 24 is gone. Chapter 28 is gone. It's not in there. It's not in there. Hmm, could it be that we made a compromise with those that believe that there's error? How are we going to get, what message do we have to give to the world? That's the third angel's message. But we want to remove it because it'll be the means of, the entering wedge to get them to read the real book. No, it's not, brothers and sisters. It's not. Now, God's law, immutable, Work of reform, those are in chapter 8 of the abridged, it's called In Defense of the Truth. Modern Revivals is in chapter 6. Chapter 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 are in the abridged version. Notice that they put chapter 29 as the first chapter in the abridged version, The Great Hope. Chapter 30, that's the second chapter. So they go through that. Chapter 35 is not in there. Why is that not in there? Don't people need to know the characters and aims? Don't Catholics need to know? But yet we're not giving it, brothers and sisters. Chapter 41. By the way, that's dealing with that third error. Revelation 18, that it's the devil, not God, that pours out the bulls. That's the chapter that deals with that. That's not in there. 
because it's not true, see. Don't believe it that they took these out just randomly because, you know, we got to reshape the book and make it packageable. We have to make it sellable. See, that's not true. We're dealing with spiritualism. And it has just taken the great controversy and adapted it, changed it. I don't know what your conference is going to put out. By the way, they've just made a rule. I've read it. The only conference president that objected to this was Michigan conference president. But they have made, they voted that no layperson can do a mass distribution of the great controversy without conference approval. Only the conference can tell what to do and what not to do. And you know what Jay Gallimore said, Elder Gallimore from Michigan Conference? He said this. He said, if we do this, we're shackling the ankles of the laity. Spiritualism, brother and sister. It's coming in. It is coming in and it is taking over. And it takes the book that we're told of all books need to go out. And it takes it and it goes like this and it sends it back to us. In the name of love. But we're told, we already know what happened to Protestantism. It's false charity that's blinding our eyes. We believe it's loving. But really, it's the enemy removing our message. I want to close tonight by sharing with you what the spirit of prophecy has to say about this. Let us read what the Lord impressed Ellen White with about the great controversy. And you tell me if we have any right to tamper with this book. This book needs to be remain the way it is and we by faith need to finish the work. Come what may. Come what may. In 1890, she said this. This is all from Cole Porter Ministry. So you just find the chapter on... And I'll give, you, I'll give you the page. It's page 129. And all around there. 1890, she said, God gave me the light contained in the great controversy and patriarchs and prophets. And this light was needed to arouse the people to prepare for the great day of God, which is just before us. These books contain God's direct appeal. God's appeal. But what have we done? Where's his appeal? You know what, brothers and sisters, you know what we've done? It just occurred to me. What is Babylon? Confusion. We've confused it all up, taken things up. So God is not even making his direct appeal anymore. Thus, he is speaking to the people in stirring words, urging them to to make ready for his coming. The light God has given in these books should not be what? Concealed. Don't cover it up. Are we concealing it? Here, here's an abridged version. We don't want you to know everything that's in the great controversy. Please, don't, don't persecute me. I'm loving. I love you. It says it should not be concealed. I know that the statement made that these books cannot be sold is untrue. Oh, even in her day. I know. For the Lord has instructed me that this is said because human devising has blocked the way for their sale. Today, we're not even talking about selling. We're just giving it away free and we have a problem with it. You know? It cannot be denied that these works were not the product of any human mind. They are the voice of God speaking to His people and they will have an influence upon minds that other books do not have. This God promises. How can we say... Postmodernism, you know, will reject the book. God said it will have an influence. He said when? And the final warning, people will pull out these books. They'll start reading. We give up too soon. We say, ah, they're not going to read it. They're going to throw it away. No, brothers and sisters, God said. The results of the circulation of this book, the great controversy, are not to be judged by what now appears. Don't judge the results. By reading it, some souls will be aroused and will have courage to unite themselves at once 
with those who keep the commandments of God. But a much larger number who read it will not take their position until they see the very events taking place that are foretold in it. We just took away the events that are foretold in it. We need to wait. Don't say, don't use the excuse just because you don't believe in the great controversy that the postmodern mind will not receive it. Give it to them. They might throw it on the shelf. And when these closing events take place, they will read it. That's what we should do. The fulfillment of some of the predictions will inspire faith that others also will come to pass. And when the earth is lightened with the glory of the Lord in the closing work, many souls will take their position on the commandments of God as the result of this agency, the great controversy. 1890, I was moved by the Spirit of the Lord to write that book. And while working upon it, I felt a great burden upon my soul. Look at this. The Lord has set before me matters which are of urgent importance for the present time and which what? Reach into the future. You see, one of the things he said that I didn't bring out in his article was that back in Ellen White's days, you know, they weren't as sensitive as they are now, back in those days. So the book was really, you know, it was well accepted. But today, we can't really do that because times have changed. If you read that article, I, I couldn't bring out everything. But Ellen White said that the Lord has set before me matters which are of urgent importance for the present, so she was talking about her time, and which reach into the future. So that destroys that argument. That today, you know, no, God said, send it. The words that have been spoken in a charge to me. This is not an ordinary book. Write in a book the things which thou hast seen and heard, and let it go to all the people, for the time is at hand when past history will be repeated. There ain't no past history in that adaptive version. This is a direct command of God to the servant of the Lord to write in a book the things which thou hast seen. We have no right, brothers and sisters, to take it for whatever reason and tamper with it and change it around. I know someone else who thinks he has the right to do it, though. He's always tampered with the thus saith the Lord. Look what she says. I've been aroused at 1, 2, or 3 o'clock in the morning with some point forcibly impressed upon my mind as if spoken by the voice of God. I pray that we haven't taken those points and, and messed with them. Oh, many will depart from the faith and get heed to seducing spirits. That's spiritualism. Those who become thoroughly acquainted with the lessons in these books will see the dangers before them and will be able to discern the plain, straight path marked out for them. I know someone who doesn't want anybody to discern that. They will make straight paths for their feet. Can they still do it with the adaptive version? People say, well, the Lord can still work. I've heard it with my own ears. The Lord will still use it. Don't believe that lie. Don't believe it. Don't even believe it if people are baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Don't believe it, brothers and sisters. I don't believe God makes compromise. I don't think He compromises what He inspired what we seem to do today. Why, the great controversy should be widely circulated. Look, it contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. In its outline of the closing scenes. Oh, where's the outline? Where's the past, present, and future, brothers and sisters? The last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any of my other books. i got to get to this one. Listen, she's talking about the, the Holy Spirit traced these truths in the great controversy upon my heart and mind as indelibly as the law was traced by the finger of God upon the tables of stone. Now, who took that law and changed the Sabbath to Sunday? Which was under the control of what? Spiritualism changed it are we tampering in the same way with this book otherwise she's lying she said the holy spirit traced these truths upon my heart as indelibly as the law was traced by the finger of god we cannot brothers and sisters for any reason take this book and change it and remove it and 
abridge it, and adapt it. Well, we're doing the same thing that the papacy, under the control of spiritualism, in fact, I'm, I, I'm not saying if, we are. That's why I'm here to tell you this. We are, brothers and sisters. There's no place else to go after Seventh-day Adventism. When the devil does his dirty work, he's done. It's over. Do you realize we're living in the time of the shaking? People are rising up against this. There's going to be a shaking. Are you going to remain? Is your faith of the character that will remain? You know what we're told? We have to have a faith that is able to do we endure weariness, delay, and hunger. Hunger. Martin Luther said this, If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point that the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly I may be professing Christ, where the battle rages is where the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is merely flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Are you flinching, brothers and sisters, at this point? This is where the battle is raging. This is it. I'm going to tell you something shocking. And I want you to go home and pray about it. In the North American Division Health Summit that Elder Wilson attended, I'm not against Elder Wilson. I'm against no man. I'm against spiritualism. Please hear me. Because at the North American Division Health Summit, I have it on my computer, Elder Wilson said that God is going to bless all the versions of the great controversy, the great hope. I'm sorry, Elder Wilson, but I don't believe that. I don't believe it. And I hope you don't believe it either. Now, am I saying Elder Wilson is, you know, am I putting him down? No. No. Absolutely not. Please don't misunderstand me. Does he have a lot of pressure on him? So much you don't even realize. I don't, even as a pastor, I have no idea what he's going through. But I can tell you what, there is a God that can sustain him. And he needs to take a stand like he did at the opening meetings at the general. Remember how bold he sounded? What's going on now, brothers and sisters? What is going on? Do not, I'm going to tell you this, do not rest your hope in a man. I don't care if it's Elder Wilson, me, whoever you like to listen to and follow, do not. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying he's a false, you know, he's an imposter. I'm just saying, do not do that. You race, rest your faith on a thus saith the Lord. That's all I can base my faith on. And the only reason why I'm sharing this with you is because I believe that this is an indication that spiritualism is not only attacking the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it is finishing its work. It's finishing it. Our people are blinded by a false love. We're calling Seventh-day Adventists love and the great controversy hate. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is it. If you don't have your house in order, you better go get it in order. This is it, brothers and sisters. It's over. When Chris Hudson comes next month, he's going to tell you the same thing. Except he's coming from a different angle. Hear the servant of the Lord when he comes. This brother will preach the truth. I trembled in my seat at the Uchi Pines Church when he preached. I went home. I got down on my knees. And I didn't get up for a long time. This is blatant spiritualism in the church. What are we supposed to do about it? Number one, this is from 1 Testimonies 3.43. Discern between pure Bible truth and fables. That's what I'm trying to present here. Amen. You have to present it too. If you're going to deal with spiritualism, you have to present the truth and help people to discern between what is Bible truth and fables. Fables. This all comes from 1 Testimonies 3.43. Number two, acknowledge the claims of truth. You can't just discern Right? Oh, I, I know. You know, I'm going to preach a sermon pretty soon. You know what it's called? I know, I know, I know. 
That's the title. That's the title. I have a dear sister I love with all my heart, and she knows I'm going to preach this sermon because I told her. And every time we'd have a little conversation about things that she ought to consider, she would say, I know, I know, I know. It's not enough to I know, I know, I know. You've got to acknowledge the claims of truth. To acknowledge means that you surrender. You get down on your knees and you pray. You cry out to God. You acknowledge those claims. Number three, those that are under control of spiritualism need to entreat those who have had a religious experience and who have faith in the promises of God to plead with the mighty deliverer in their behalf. This is where intercessory prayer comes in. So if you're under the control of spiritualism and you discern between truth and error and you acknowledge the claims, you don't stop there. You have to go to someone who's standing for present truth, who's living, who has a religious experience and believes in the promise. And you have to ask for help that they would plead, not just pray, plead with the mighty deliverer in their behalf. And number four, the saints of God with deep humility must what? Fast. Fast and pray. Not just pray. You see where the health message comes in? You thought the health message was just, you know, to lose weight and... Listen, the health message is part of how we recover from spiritualism. If you cannot deny yourself, then you're too self-centered to help someone else and the Lord can't use you. And so if you're going to deal with spiritualism, just accept it right now. Get it in your mind. That's why I fasted. I'm fasting and praying because I'm presenting these topics on spiritualism and I want the church to hear what the Lord has to say. If you're going to deal with spiritualism and now you know what it is, you need to fast and pray. And I'm not talking about fasting from television. or all that. I'm talking about fasting from food, not eating. Drink. Deny yourself. Jesus did, didn't he? He even fasted from sleeping. Oh, what a battle we have, brothers and sisters. First Testimonies 3.43, read it. These are the steps. There's no other way, she says. No other way. The last great conflict is before us. But help is to come to all who love God and obey His law. Amen. And the earth and the whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. Another angel is to come down from heaven. For, this is Review and Herald 4.19.06. This angel represents the giving of the loud cry, which is to come from those who are preparing to cry mightily with a strong voice. Are you preparing? This is what we are to cry. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils in the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. We have a testing message to give. And I am instructed to say to our people, unify, unify. But we are not to unify with those who are departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Do you hear me? As I read the word of the Lord to you, spiritualism we are not to unify with. With our hearts sweet and kind and true, we are to go forth to proclaim the message, giving no heed to those who lead away from the truth. If you unify with those that are giving heed to seducing spirits, you are partaking in the very work of spiritualism. The cry today in the Adventist church is for unity based on common understanding. Not historical beliefs, not sound doctrine. Brothers and sisters, please stand for truth. Fight for truth. Don't compromise. Don't look at the color of his skin. I know. He's a white man with a gray beard. I don't know if Noah was white, black, or Chinese. I don't know. Olive-colored skin. I can tell you one thing. These people 
probably had the postmodern mindset, didn't they? They didn't believe. They, they had no concept of what he was talking about. Neither did Noah, except for what? A thus saith the Lord. That's all he had. Are you going to be like this crazy brother here? Look at him. What is he doing? He's doing two things. See the ark in the background? He's living exactly the way God commanded him to live. Exactly. And he's preaching the message exactly the way God commanded him to preach. He's talking about a flood that they have no conception. And they're laughing and mocking him. Is he an example of the love of God? Yes. Noah was an example. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Will you take a stand, brothers and sisters? Are you going to stand up against spiritualism? Are you going to look at it in its loving face? Are you going to make yourself of no reputation? Are you going to let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus? They called the Son of God a Samaritan and that he had a devil. Did he? He was the most loving man. He was God that ever walked the earth. They've done it to your Lord. They'll do it to you. But they won't if you conform. They won't if you're too scared to be labeled. And so, brothers and sisters, let us take a stand. Let us go forward and fight the battles of the Lord by faith. Let us call everything what it really is. Let us be a part of the closing of this work. Are you going to finish the work? This is our work. This is what it is. Spiritualism is love. And you're going to have to be loving to tackle it. You have to be loving. As we pray, I invite you to stand with me to seek the Lord. We don't have it all worked out, brothers and sisters. As much as we have the the Word of God, we still must get on our hands and knees and pray earnestly. We've got to get up and preach the Word. We've got to teach it. We've got to go house to house. We've got to search for people. We've got to bring the message to the people. And I want to pray. I, I want to be today like Noah. You know who I want to be like too? Jeremiah. I want to be like Jeremiah because you know what the Lord is saying to you and me today? He's saying, diminish not a word. Father in heaven, as we close this meeting, how do I convey? I feel like Ellen White. She said, how how do I put in words what you're impressing upon my heart? How do I convey, Lord? That's not my job, I guess. That's your job. We have just been through a long presentation, step by step, exposing the foundation of spiritualism today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're calling light darkness and darkness light. We've got everything backwards. We're right back where we were when you were here, Lord. And we're about to crucify this message that contains the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're about to destroy it and then crumple it up and then hand it to the world and say, here you go. I love you. Don't hurt me. I hope you don't dislike me. Lord, may we not do that. May no one in here do that, Lord. I, this example, I, I, I'm afraid that it's not really impacting our minds right now. I pray that as we leave, we will wrestle with this. Ask those questions. I called. I called the North American Division, brothers and sisters. I talked to Carol Barron. 
I asked her about the book. She told me. She gave me all this information. Call. Write. Protest. This is an abomination. What we're doing. Lord. Though none go with us, still we will follow you, Lord. There's a shaking going on right now. People are being sifted out. We don't have to leave the organization to be sifted out. We can be in the organization and be sifted. Lord, may no one here coward away like Peter and deny you. May we take a stand for brothers and sisters. It's time to stand. Put away your selfish idols. Put away your petty sins. Put away the sin that does so easily beset you. Put it away. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Reach out to Jesus. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, you double-minded. Oh, brothers and sisters, let's do this. Oh, Father, each one is special in your sight. We need to get ready. It's about to go down. Will we even recognize the latter rain when it's poured out? Or will we call it an unclean spirit? I believe, Lord, that those are being led by this false love. We'll look at the work that the latter rain, the Holy Spirit is doing in, in raising up people to boldly proclaim. They'll say, that is the spirit of the devil. Oh, Lord, may not one person in this room do that. Take us now, Father. It's been a long Sabbath. And Lord, if I've erred in going too long, please forgive me, Father. You told me to share this, and I've done it the best I can. Please be with each one. And now take them. And keep them. And direct them into the present truth. And encourage them and empower them that they will stand. You're just looking for people who are willing to stand for you. Where are the watchmen? Where are the standard bearers? May they be in this room, I pray. Thank you, Lord. We love you and we know you love us. Bless your people. We pray without, before we close, we pray for Elder Wilson. We pray for the leaders, for the president that I mentioned, for the ministerial secretary, for all of the leaders that are under tremendous pressure and many under tremendous delusion. Father in heaven, we lift them up to you. We pray for the pastors of this conference of this church. We pray for the elders. We pray, Heavenly Father, we do not at all criticize for the sake of criticizing. We weep, O Father. We mourn. Please, Lord, hear our prayers. We ask it in our great need. In the name of Jesus, amen.